Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita sekalian. Shalom, Om Swastiastu. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants of the Global Food Security Conference organized by the Atlantic Council. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak, to give uh, some remarks on this topic. Since yesterday, I took note that a lot of participants coming from many parts of the world with their impressive background and expertise in the field of agriculture, food security, And I'm sure by the brief moments I was here, I'm very confident that all the contributions, all the remarks, all the comments, the suggestions, recommendations will, of course, I understand, be compiled. And I think this will be a, a very valuable contribution to finding solutions for the threat of global food insecurity that is facing our planet. Actually, I would like to thank and commend the initiators of this conference, Mr. Fred Kempe and the Athletic Council, General Wesley Clark, Mr. Guaraf. I call him Mr. G because sometimes a bit uh, difficult to pronounce your surname. It's also difficult to pronounce my surname. I think my surname is longer than your surname. Uh, I would like to thank the initiators for this effort. In fact, in my opinion, the main topic of the whole G20 summit should be about food security. In my opinion, food security, or shall we say f- the threat of food insecurity, is an existential threat. To humankind because without food there is no civilization there is no humankind because of the expert standing here i do not pretend or aspire to give an expert perspective i will give overview an overview of the indonesian perspective on this issue and perhaps this can help contribute to our general uh, understanding first of all food energy and water actually is one cycle that is interrelated to secure food we need water Water is the essence of life. And to secure food, the speakers before me have emphasized the importance of energy. In this cycle, which in front of us has proven to be a threat of scarcity, this is compounded by more threats that compound this existential threat. First, whether we like it or not, there is a population explosion. Maybe this is sensitive. There are part of the global elite still very influential, still very powerful in even in my country, that do not like for us to talk about population explosion. But if we are a real leader, sometimes leaders must say unpleasant things. This is a dilemma, it's a paradox, especially for politicians, especially for politicians who want to get elected. Fortunately, the Indonesian gender election and the presidential election is still rather in the future. This is the dilemma of people in leadership position. If we warn about a danger coming, they accuse us of being pessimistic. My president, President Jokowi, this year alone, I think, has spoken maybe 20 five times more in public warning the indonesian people that we are facing difficult times next year will be very difficult and there are people who accuse him of spreading pessimism and i understand maybe some people cannot accept the necessities of how do we face this population explosion for instance indonesia our increase in population every year is 1.9 percent that is 5 million new babies every year 5 million new mouths 5 million the size of singapore Every year in Indonesia, there is a new Singapore. You see, Indonesians, when they face adversity, they laugh. Indonesians are happy people. Sometimes we don't know what's ahead of us. Maybe we will go somewhere happily. What I'm saying is this. Every 10 years, a new Malaysia. What government in the world, what expert in the world can consider feeding 5 million more mouths a normal and an easy challenge? My friend, Mr. G., He said he's very proud of feeding his family. A leader of Indonesia must think of feeding 5 million babies every year. Anybody who wants to run for president of Indonesia, I think, should consult his psychoanalyst, I think. The challenges in front of our government is not an easy challenge. But this is not something 
that we must be afraid of. As a former soldier, you know, they say, former soldiers, old soldiers never die. They just fade away. General Clark has faded away today. He's supposed to be here in front of me. But, you know, many old soldiers, like myself, like General Clark, old soldiers never die. They just fade away. That is somewhere. But in Indonesia, old soldiers never die and they never fade away. Until the Almighty God calls us. Then, not only do we fade away, we are called away very fast. So, this population explosion is something in front of us. Five million jobs. Five million new spaces in schools, in hospitals. This is the dimension of our challenge. Climate change. We, we feel it. Jakarta is the sea level is increasing five centimeters every year and during one of my visits to the coastal area of Tanjung Priok families the water is in their living room they are sleeping in their bedroom with the sea water in their bedroom climate change is not some theory it is in front of us in Krawang which is maybe what one hour from here the sea has come in maybe already at least three four kilometers Three, four kilometers, maybe more. Kerawang lebih banyak ya. Kerawang sudah, sudah berapa kilo itu masuknya? Ya, Kerawang, you, you are from Kerawang, are you? Tiga, empat kilometer. Gue baru ngomong empat kilometer dari. Pinter aja loh. This the speaker of the West Java Parliament. So, climate change for Indonesia is real. Can you imagine four kilometers times 200 kilometers long? 300 square kilometers. How many hectares have we lost from productive land, from arable land, from our rice bowl? Kerawang is the rice bowl of Indonesia. Indonesia. And of course, in front of us, geopolitical conflict. I just would like to reiterate, you know, Indonesia, our traditional foreign policy is one of friendship to all countries. We respect all countries. We respect all great powers. We are free and active in our relationship. We always try to maintain equal in our respect and relationship. We call ourselves, we consider ourselves by history. Indonesia was one of the founders of the non-aligned movement. I would like to reiterate this because although we consider United States as a very good friend and strategic partner of Indonesia, the United States having many times assisted Indonesia in our darkest moments, in the uh, United States have supported our war of independence. So we acknowledge this friendship, but as a good friend, sometimes we have to be courageous enough to remind our friends, remind our close friends who we admire, who we want to emulate. I think the top Indonesian intellectuals, educated leaders, most of them are educated in Western countries. I think many of our leaders understand and have read your Declaration of Independence. We also aspire to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is our goal also for our people. But this is important. Important. In any geopolitical conflict, there are always two sides to a story. And each side is convinced they are right. Each side is willing to die for what they consider to be right. I have to remind everybody, there is always two sides to a conflict. The important thing is, do we want to resolve the conflict or not? If we do not want to resolve the conflict, we are entering a very dangerous region and a dangerous zone of time. A few days ago, I was listening to a remark by a very senior former United States military leader, Admiral Mullen, I think three days ago. I think Admiral Mullen was the former chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Please correct me if I'm... It, he was the former chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff. He reminded everybody, it's on the YouTube, we are in danger of a nuclear war. We are in danger of a nuclear war. We hope, we pray that the leaders of the world will be wise and enlightened. But we have seen in history many great conflict, many great explosion, conflagration happen out of accident. Wars happen because of accident. Sometimes wars happen because of one lieutenant or one captain who start firing because he was afraid. Therefore, what we talk about is compounded by these threats. Geopolitical conflict on all matters. In our opinion, the situation of the world, the fact that our planet is getting smaller, we need we need wisdom, we need compromise, we need patience, we need courage to go halfway. Zero-sum game victories, I don't think, is feasible in the current state of the world. We can be right, but are we doing it in the long-term interest of our people? Without food, energy, and water, economic crisis, social
social unrest, civil war, failed state. Therefore, food, energy, and water is existential. In Indonesia, we are been blessed. We have been blessed the last three, four years with very consistent and very big rainfall. However, now we have to be prepared after the phenomena called La Nina. We have to be prepared for El Nino, and when El Nino comes, we have to be prepared for several years of dry weather. Therefore, it's also a part of our initiative, the Indonesian defense community. We are working very hard to secure water. We are exploring for water in the dry parts of our country. I think the last two, three years, our military, we have drilled and we have made pumps energy in something like uh, 700 uh, sites. And within this month, our defense university, we have sent survey teams and we will drill, I think, another 120 water pumps. And also, what is very interesting is there is a new geological uh, phenomena, actually. The experts tell us there are underwater rivers flowing to the coast of many of our islands. And this is very, very, very prevalent in volcanic islands. And we are, I think, the largest island groups with volcanoes. There are many underwater rivers flowing every day to the coast. And now our mission is to find where it goes out and then to trap them in a flexible pipes and bring by pumps this fresh water to the land, inland to the villages. So actually, the existential threat, there are solutions in front of us and solutions which are not technologically very difficult for us. It flows every day, every hour. We have also big rivers that are flowing to the sea and with water management, with water engineering, we can make very, very good use of the water that's available. The key is the will to find solutions. When we talk about food security, there are some things, again, that's unpalatable to be spoken of, but I will say it anyway. How do we deal with food insecurity? To be very frank, if the political elites of all countries have cohesion, are united, do not fight amongst the elite who wants to be what, and the elite are informed, want to learn, want to study, and the elite will not be swayed, will not be influenced by traders. I want to make it clear, I'm not against traders. I was, before going into politics, I was a trader myself. Trade, business, that is what fuels human growth and human enterprise. But in this matter of food security, sometimes the traders think short term. The political leaders must think long term. The traders... Think of annual profit. It's not their fault. They are traders. They think of annual profit. Political leaders must think five years, 10 years, 25 years ahead. But sadly, many countries, including my own country, sometimes our elite are nearsighted, uninformed, sometimes do not want to be informed. I have been talking about food security in Indonesia, I think, for the last, I don't know, 20 years. I, when I retired from the military, I was elected as a chairman of the Farmers Association. And after that, I was elected also as the chairman of the Small Market Traders Association. Maybe many of them come here to listen to me. There, we have what now? Something like 16,000 traditional markets. 16,000. And uh, always the challenge is between the big supermarkets and the small traditional markets. How do we reconcile that they live together? Not killing the big guys absorb all the profit and the small guys die because of lack of oxygen. This is the challenge again. And many of our elites also, now after we see the conflict in other parts of the world, after the FAO, the WHO remind us, then now everybody talk about food security. But let me say very frankly, maybe three years ago, many of our elite do not even want to address the matter of food insecurity. So I think this is something that we must take note of. And therefore, events like this is very important as part of the educating the elite. Solving hunger, solving food insecurity, yes, is about seeds about technology, about this and that, and yes, but more important is the unity 
the cohesion, the ability amongst national elites and international elites to work together, to cooperate. And this is easier said than done. I do, I do understand that. So our goal must be, as all the experts say, feeding 8 billion people. The problem is availability and affordability. The problem is some of the countries have secure supply of calories and secure supply of protein. And that is the challenge, how we can reach zero hunger, which is SDG number two, the sustainable development goal that we must all aspire to. Here we see the dark green, those countries secure calorie supply, and the dark blue secure protein supply. Food security, the essential thing is also trade, food trade. We see uh, many countries that are reliant on calorie imports. We thank the Almighty God that Indonesia actually, we, we need not be reliant on calorie import. We are now self-sufficient in rice. We are also able to produce maize on our own and we have alternatives to wheat. The other essential element of food security, as everybody has mentioned, of course, is synthetic fertilizer. Half of the world is reliant on synthetic fertilizer. Also, the reserves of potash and phosphate is also not distributed equally around the world. It's concentrated in Canada, Russia, some parts of the world. This will affect global food production and therefore, once again, let us not be morally upset about the use of food as weapon. Food has always been a weapon throughout the history of mankind. Thousands of years, wars have erupted to secure food, to secure land, to secure water. So let us be very realistic, ladies and gentlemen. That's why leaders must always calculate the entire spectrum of the threat. As a former military officer, we learned that war is not just the beginning or the war start with the firing of a shot. War is already a spectrum. Trade competition is war. Financial war. We can destroy a nation by destroying their currency. So once again, leaders must always think the entire spectrum. Because, as I said, a conflict has two sides. One side may be strong in this area, the other side may be strong in the other area. And two conflict sides, they want to win, they want to survive. Therefore, they will use all weapons at their disposal. That is the lesson of history. Fertilizer will be strategic because of the source of fertilizers, source of the ingredients of fertilizer. We must be prepared for daunting challenges ahead. We all know, everybody's talked about the vicious the cycles that are emerging. Food price increasing, oil very high, the price of natural gas is already 10 times higher than two years ago in Europe. Cost of maritime trade three times pre-pandemic average. Interest rates rising, price of fertilizers increase, and this results in cost of living increase, real incomes falling down, the ability of to cope small families, farmers, decreasing the financial power of several countries decreasing what is the result we have to be prepared for social and political unrest in many parts of the globe some more figures uh, wheat price have risen 200 percent in two years palm oil nearly 200 percent in two years indonesia very fortunate we are the largest producer of palm oil and at one time we were embargoed by Europe, our palm oil, but it turned out perhaps to be a blessing in disguise. Because we could not go to the European market, we are forced to use our palm oil for biofuel, for biodiesel, and now we have biogasoline. Sometimes threat, sometimes adversity result in opportunity. So we, maize, sugar, soybean, we understand also the components of food that energy very strong component a lot of people have spoken about this corn high component soybean wheat i think nearly 40 percent 38 percent components energy rice not so high peanuts not so high protein protein crisis in the next 25 years the demand for protein will rise quite significantly from now around 324 tons 324 million tons a year to nearly 600 million tons 80 percent increase in the next 25 years and like it or not i think we have to reassess the propensity or the our habit of eating a lot of meat from cattle from chicken, from pork, because the input for one kilogram of body weight meat 
we need for cattle is 31 kilograms of input. For pork is 10 kilograms. For chicken is 4 kilograms. The most efficient is fish, 2 kilograms. And some even 1.7 kilograms. So the future is actually aquaculture to, to provide our protein needs. This is force of nature. Those who adapt, those who want to learn, those who want to invest will survive. And actually, the resources are in front of us. Once again, Indonesia is blessed by the Almighty God. We have many challenges, but we have a lot of sea. I think we have one of the largest, the longest coastline in the world. I think maybe Canada and Chile more than us. But Indonesia, is, maybe we are second to, to Canada, I think. The longest coast. Can you imagine how many hectares of aqua farms we can have on the coast and off the coast? We have now... 23 million hectares of arable land, but we have also 120 million hectares of forest. Sad to say, about 80 million hectares of our forest are already degraded. So, what is our vision? What is my strategy, which I proposed to my president, that the degraded forest we convert to productive land to create food and energy? They are already degraded, but before they supported forests. That means the land is fertile by the greed of many short-term, can I say that in an audience that's a lot of Americans here, you know. But I would say that many capitalists are very greedy. Even some capitalists, they are proud. They say greed is good. That is the essence, I think, of neoliberalism. There are capitalists say greed is good. Let me be richer and richer, and I don't care what happened to the poor and the hungry. Once again, I do not criticize capitalism per se, but I'm saying we have suffered. It's not anybody's fault, it's our collective fault. Whenever God has given so much blessings to a people, sometimes the people become complacent, and the people become negligent in protecting their resources and their future. So, can you imagine? If the 80 million hectares or 88 million, I think the data is there. If we convert only 16 million, our BAPANAS, our planning agency calculated 16 million, 16 million of those 80 million degraded. If we convert this to food production, we can be the bread basket of the world. So this existential threat and this, let us say, ecological or environmental disaster, we can turn around to be environmental and food opportunity for the world. We do not need too much technology. We do not need... The nature has given us this, let us say, comparative advantage. 16 million hectares, let us say 8 million for food and 8 million for energy. We can produce renewable energy, clean energy, bioenergy from a lot of plants, from palm oil, from aren, palm sugar, from cassava. We also, we are in a tropical climate. We can have three crops a year, three crops a year. With good management, good technology, can you imagine the increase in production? We also have 225 million hectares of marine territory. We also have, within that area, there's 23 million hectares of marine protected area. This is the breeding ground where our fish, the fish of the world, come to Indonesia to breed and to lay their eggs. The fish of the world breed in Indonesian waters, lay their eggs in Indonesian waters. So, Indonesia's current role. We are now number one grower of palm oil. We are now number five grower of cassava without the additional 16 million hectares of land. We are now the number two producer of captured fisheries. But we have a vacuum. We have a need for 40,000 fishing boats of 300 gross ton to 500 gross ton. We have a need of 40,000 fishing boats. This is not including the aqua farm that we plan to build. By the way, if any of the participants are still here on the 15th or on the 16th, I will be visiting a fish aqua farm. If any of you would like to join me, I will be very honored if you would like to, to see that this is not a dream in the future. We are ready. Some of our entrepreneurs are already uh, carrying this out. And by the way, making a lot of money. But that is the risk. High risk, high gain. To be the pioneer 
is always very courageous, need courage. We are the number one grower of seaweed, healthy protein, antioxidant, is against cancer. And we are now already, alhamdulillah, self-sufficient in rice production. Kita sudah swa sembada beras. So I think uh, joining Jokowi in this government, I think was a correct decision on my part. I'm proud that I joined much to many opposition from my own party. But as I said, that's the challenge of leaders, right? Sometimes we have to have the guts to choose unpopular positions. At that time, it was popular. It was, at that time, it was unpopular in my own party. But now they come to realize, oh yeah, that guy is not that stupid. You know, sometimes soldiers, we have the reputation of having no brains, especially infantry. I was in the infantry, you know. The smart guys in the army, they always go to the engineers and the artillery. Those of us who are average, they send to the infantry. But now the developments in a certain part of the world where there is now open conflict, I will not say where, it's somewhere in Europe, the development of war tactics. Now they say it is the return of the poor bloody infantry. One infantryman can destroy a tank with a rocket which costs only maybe $100,000 can destroy a tank which costs $5 million. So, I think uh, I made the correct decision also at that time when I was young, joining the infantry. And as a former soldier, I realized the importance of food. I come now to a topic. My favorite topic actually is cassava. But this is also Bill Gates' favorite crop. I think cassava will prove to be the savior crop of the world. Indonesia, I think, can become the foremost producer of cassava and cassava is the most efficient in the need for input for water etc etc if you see here the input for cassava is quite efficient produces 250,000 calorie but only need 65 cubic meter of water per metric ton consider this to rice 1139 wheat 954 maize 850 very efficient cassava is now a strategic food crop it can produce the replacement for wheat, for pasta, noodles, etc., bread. Here, I have I've, uh, examples. <laughs> this is already in production by our entrepreneurs. We are producing pasta from cassava. <laughs> Instant noodles. Rasa mi goreng. <laughs> Kasafa, singkong. This Korean beef mushroom. Kasafa. <laughs> we can produce bioethanol. We can produce alcohol, vitamin, bioflavonate, other products, bioplastics, glue, explosive, feed for cattle, cassava, very efficient, we have seen that, health benefits, 100% gluten-free, low glycemic index, high in iron and calcium, I continue, I think I've taken a lot of the time, cassava products, already in the Indonesian market. Here we also see we already have the patents for modified cassava. We call it mokaf. We also have the intellectual property rights for the industrial pro processes. There's already a factory in Bangka producing cassava. I hope the inventor of mokaf, Professor Subagio, please stand up. I hope you c the, the cassava professor, I think the foremost in the world, working many years in Nigeria, in many parts of the world, and uh, we see they're producing processes. There's also Mr. Fidrianto, an entrepreneur, a courageous entrepreneur who pioneered the industrial production of mokaf. We also now starting uh, producing our logistics strategic reserve. So let me conclude by how I see Indonesia's future role. I think uh, we will be the number one exporter of wheat flour equivalent, mokaf from cassava. We will also be the number one exporter of sustainable 
marine aquaculture production. We, we, we are also, we will be the number one exporter of sustainable shrimp aquaculture production. We do not want to deplete the natural fish. We have to preserve it because we are the breeding ground for many of the fish of the world. We will also be the number one exporter of sustainable lobster aquaculture production. So we will be in the forefront to produce protein and calorie in the world. We want to be a factor in solving global insecurity threat. And we invite partners from all over the world to join in. Can you imagine 16 million hectares? How many combined harvesters? How many tractors? How many silos? How many railroads? How many harbors? How many technologies? How many scientists? How many water engineers that we can accept and we can absorb? So we are open. We invite all partners from around the world that I think we can be a factor for growth. Indonesia can perhaps be an additional factor in the growth of the world economy and in really providing solutions to overcome world hunger. In conclusion, you see, they do not give coffee here for me. If they give coffee, maybe I speak for another two hours. It is my opinion that I hold very strong to successfully handle the challenge. We need global peace and we need global partnership. We have to work together. If we can come to this, if we can reach out to our adversaries, if we can overcome past mistakes, if we can admit to ourselves that perhaps we have made some mistakes and we can work in a global partnership, I think we can solve the problem. But as I mentioned, in any country, without the cohesion, without the unity, without compromise, without cooperation amongst the national elite, there can be no national prosperity. To have prosperity, we need peace. That is the lesson of mankind history. I was a former soldier. I know the ravages of conflict. There is no benefit to war and conflict. Sometimes we are forced to. But as a former soldier, I realize we must avoid conflict. That does not mean that we must be defenseless. No. Apparently, humans as a species are very prone to domination and to take what is in front of them that is not protected and defended. That's the human nature. I think that concludes my remarks. Let us work together to achieve understanding compromise. Hopefully, in this G20 in Bali, the name of Bali, of the Balinese people is Pulau Dewata, the island of the gods. So we hope that there will be magic and miracles in the island of the gods. Let us work for peace and prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you.